By the time we get done today, you'll probably know more about Mormonism than they know about Mormonism. Okay? Because, well, I mean, think about it. A lot of kids, a lot of kids are Christians. They go to Christian church, but the, you know, they, the, you know, they're really fuzzy on on what Christians believe. They probably couldn't define it. They, they wouldn't know what the creeds are, or the Apostles' Creed, or anything like that. You know, they they would just be fuzzy about it. Um, same thing. The same thing with a lot of these guys is. Um, even by the little bit I'm going to give you today, you're going to know more about Mormon, Mormon history than they do. There's a couple of reasons for that. Is, uh, one is lot, not all of it is flattering to, to them. Number two is um, they, they keep it hidden. They, they don't really tell their full history. They tell a very cosmetically, they have cosmetic surgery on their history. Or it's just absolute silence, okay? Um, and you know what the weird thing is? There's some really smart people who are Mormons, some really, really smart people. But it shows you you can be really smart about something and really dumb about something else. All right? So uh, we're going to take a, a look at what, just a, a quick tour of what they believe. Um, and for some of you, you might have the attitude, well, Mormons are just kind of like Christians, but just believe a bunch of a little bit different stuff. And I think you're going to see it's quite dramatic what, what a real Mormon who really subscribes to it actually believes. That said, a lot of the friends you have that are Mormons, because they don't know a lot of this stuff or haven't, haven't been faced with a lot of this stuff, are kind of in that boat. They, 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 you know, they would be shocked to know what, to get down to the, the nitty gritty of what really happened. And when they see their own history, um, well, well, we'll see what happens uh, as we look at this, okay? So here's part one, Mormonism. So they call it the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. And it was founded by this guy, Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was born in the 18, early 1800s in upstate New York. And he was a farm kid. Um, he was literate. Not, he could barely, he could spell, but he misspelled most everything like some of you. And, and well, without spell check, you, most of you would be, most of you would suck, right? And that works. But, but he, could, he could spell. He was well-versed in the Bible. Um, that was, he, he knew, you know, he went like anybody else, he went to churches. And the area of upstate New York that he was from had gone through revival after revival, revival after revival, and so much that they actually called it the burnt out district. And um, he was, he was a, a young guy um, who was basically from a farm background with no higher education, okay? Enough to get around, enough to write things, but um, as a young guy, he, he kind of had an interesting career. Um, the church actually started uh, in 1830. And the way it started, it started up in western New York because he, he, claimed, he claimed to have a vision where Jesus showed up to him, where actually an angel showed up to him, um, and gave him some golden plates that he was allowed to translate. And once he translated, he had to give them all back. And then he took this reams of paper that he had translated. He didn't actually translate it. Um, what he did is he, he, had a, he had what's called a seer stone. I think I mentioned one of those before. It's like a, an, an opal. And um, it was used by the superstitious people in the 1800s, usually to con people out of stuff, although some people believed in him, like some people used to believe in Ouija boards, or some people now believe in tarot cards, you know, tarot cards. And, and it was one of those kind of deals. And um, he actually used it to, to defraud people from money when he was a younger guy. Um, he'd pretend like he could find buried treasure. And when the, when the opal glowed in his hand, he'd go, oh, there's treasure here. So he'd collect money off the farmer while the farmer's digging. He, you know, once the farmer got himself in the hole, he'd book it out of there and go down the road 20, 30 miles, rip somebody else off with this promise of gold. He was dealing in the, in the superstition and the, the, the ignorance of the farmers around, you know? And so he got busted for that, went, went to, uh, had, got fined, they took him to court as basically somebody who was um, ripping people off. But it didn't stop there. So he gets this vision. Yeah. You can't see the screen? Okay, sorry about that. Can you see that now? Okay. Um, so he starts this church, right? And the background of the church, they started in New York, and uh, he, somebody paid for him to get this, this book 
uh, which we'll look into what it, what it really is and says, this book published that is the foundation, the cornerstone for the Mormon religion. The book is, is supposedly, uh, was supposedly translated from Egyptian hieroglyphics that were inscribed upon golden plates, um, but it, they were called reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics, which by the way, there's no such thing, but uh, Joseph Smith said there was, and they were put on these golden plates. Angel gave them to him. He said, if anybody touches these or sees these, you're going to die, they're going to die. So he kept them in a box with a sheet over them, and he would, he would look at them, and he'd put actually a blanket over his head, and then he'd, he'd dictate, and somebody uh, wrote down what he said, and then they corrected it for errors and stuff, um, several different corrections, and then sent it to the printers. And, and, and he went around peddling this book as a new revelation of Jesus Christ. The idea would be, and some, by the way, some, some Christian groups believe this too, that, that the Bible isn't a closed book, that God continues to do new revelation and bring new things. And so he was a guy who was pushing that. He goes, um, this is a new revelation of Jesus. He's looked at the landscapes here, says all these churches are fighting with each other, which they were. And... It's all screwed up, so God gave me this new revelation. He appeared to me, and I, I have, I'm the prophet, the Latter-day prophet, end times prophet that's here to help guide us in. And here's the, book of, here's the book, and it was called the Book of Mormon because the angel was named Morai. Okay, so it became the book that Morai or Mormon, the angel, gave to him. All right? They moved to Ohio. They got run out of Ohio um, because they became kind of cultish. I don't know if you've ever seen a cult in action, but it's pretty weird. You know, they, they don't trust anybody. They're always trying to get new converts. They're always trying to sell their deal. And they got to Ohio. They got run out of Ohio for some of their shenanigans. And they ended up in Missouri. Um, and then several years after Joseph Smith's death, which we'll talk about, uh, they went to Utah. And they ended up in Utah in 1847. And eight, Utah was not a state. It was a territory. So it was pretty much free game. You could do whatever you wanted in Utah Territory. Right now, the current membership is about 14 million worldwide, um, 6 million USA, and plunging. By the time you are my age, Mormonism will maybe just a faint memory of some religion that was. It's one of the fast, it's losing membership. It's, it's just draining out of the Mormon church. And, and I'll explain why in a little while. <clears throat> They consider themselves to be the restored original church, like the New Testament church. And all other churches are off the mark, corrupt, um, or corrupted, okay? So that's how they look at us, right? We're off the mark. They use the writings of Smith as their primary source of doctrines, followed by the Bible. So the hierarchy of belief is whatever Joseph Smith said is correct, and what the Bible says has to fall under that. So if it contradicts it, you always go to Joseph Smith first because he's the Latter-day prophet, right? And they oftentimes try to pass themselves off as Christians, but they're considered a cult group because of their highly unorthodox theology, all right? So here's the origin. Like I said, he was in Burnout District, and he, was, he looked at this thing. He was called, they called it technically a glass looker, and you can see in this picture he's got his hat. He would take this, this stone and put it in his hat and then look into the hat and he would narrate that and to this angel, okay? And, uh, and that's how the Book of Mormon was formed. The Book of Mormon itself is, is interesting. You could believe the entire Book of Mormon and still be a Christian. It, it, you'd be a wacky Christian. You, it'd be like this. Say you believe there were fairies. What's the, guy, what's the guy's name who wrote Sherlock Holmes? Um, you guys remember the author of Sherlock Holmes? Real smart guy. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But, but that guy, that guy, real brilliant guy, wrote Sherlock Holmes' novels. He, you going to look it up for me? Charles, yeah, Charles, not, but, yeah, Conan Doyle, yeah. Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle is a real smart guy, real great writer. If you read the Sherlock Holmes novels, you know, it's all, <clears throat> they're, they're all turns of twists of plots and stuff like that. He, he believed in fairies. He literally believed that they were little, like little fairies. Some guy in the early days of cameras had, had set up uh, a fake, kind of a fake drawing uh, that he combined with photos that made it look like there were fairies sitting on a mushroom, tops of mushrooms and stuff, and it suckered Doyle in completely. So some really smart people believe in some really stupid stuff. And you could, 
you can be a really smart person, and if you read the Book of Mormon, you go, this is true. It really wouldn't affect your Christian belief any more than if you were a Christian and you believed in fairies. It'd make you weird. People would go, <laughs> right. But it, w there's nothing in the Book of Mormon, specifically doctrinally, that <clears throat> would be offsetting tre tremendously to a Christian. All the stuff that goes against Christianity is found in his later writings um, uh, that, he, that he wrote and added to it, okay? So what the Book of Mormon is, it's, it's trying to pretend that it's a Bible. Now, this is in the 1800s, right? You know what Elizabethan English is? It's the language of Shakespeare and the King James Bible. How art thou today? You know, um, that kind of stuff. Well, no, they speak in a German sort of thing. But, but if they use the King, anybody uses the King James Bible when they quote the scriptures, they use the these and the thous and stuff like that. Well, nobody was talking like that in the, in the 1800s, in the mid-1800s. Nobody was talking like that. But Joseph Smith, when he, wrote the, when he wrote the Book of Mormon, he wrote it with in Elizabethan English. He had it translated in Elizabethan English with these and thous. Why do you think he did that? No? Exactly. He was imitating the Bible. He's trying to imitate the language of the Bible so that his book sounded like the Bible. Okay, so right away he was playing a con game. Um, and large parts of the Book of Mormon uh, are using the King James Version, and inclu including the parts of the King James Version that had translation errors that we now rec recognize as translation errors. So, you know, he's just ripping off. When you look at it, there's big chunks of the King James Bible, including stuff we go, well, that was a translation error. And he just translated right over, sort of lame for somebody who's getting it directly from God to translate all the errors too, right? Um, its story is about American Indians and Hawaiians, and they're considered to be part of the lost tribe. The lost tribe of, of, of Israel has come to America, and they're living in America, and they have big wars and stuff, kind of like, kind of in an Old Testament type of way, and one tribe slaughters another tribe. And, and it's just this fanciful tale of all these wars with, with the Jews from the lost tribe being the inhabitants of America, so all Indians are actually not Indians, they're actually Jewish, including the Hawaiians, who are actually not from Polynesia, they're actually from Israel, who came in a boat to the Americas, populated the Americas, and then sailed from the Americas to Hawaii, right? And you buying that so far? Okay. By the way, can you, can you think of any new scientific thing that could tell you whether that was true or not? It begins with a D, yeah. Yeah, DNA testing. Yeah, you know, try that out. By the way, that's one of the things that shot, that, that punched a hole in the bottom of the Mormon boat. When DNA testing came out, you can test American Indians, you can test Hawaiians and go, oops, not a drop of Jewish blood in these guys, you know? And yet, that's the story, that they were these guys. Not only that, but it, more, he, was, he was literate but not intelligent. He didn't realize that that in the Americas, there weren't, all these plants and animals were not here until the explorers came. So it's got all kinds of factual errors, including the appearance of horses, honeybees, um, in, in pre-contact America, as well as elephants, donkeys, wheat, barley, steel, sheep, goats, cattle, silk, none of which ever existed in America during the time he was supposedly, this was supposedly, this true account was supposedly happened. It's a, it's an impossible high wall to get over uh, that Mormons ask you to do just to believe it. So while it's full of nonsense, it's kind of also like it's just a silly, silly tale. I'm trying to just put it that way. Mark, and by the way, um, one of the things that the Mormons will ask you to do if you meet a Mormon, and they're convinced that the Book of Mormon is God's word, and they want you to pray about it and to read it and pray about it. Just let me warn you about reading. I'm one of the few people I know that's actually read the Book of Mormon because Mark Twain said it's like chloroform in print. You know, It's like taking, take a bunch of sleeping pills and try to read the Book of Mormon. That, it's so boring. It is just the most boring thing you've ever read. And they, they say, okay, read the Book of Mormon and then pray about it. 
And if, you're, if God puts a warm sensation in your heart, you'll know that it's true. That's how you know it's true. Forget that it's full of all these factual errors. You know it's true because you'll, you'll feel that it's true, right? And the last guy, in fact, the guy, one of the guys that did all the drywall here was a Mormon guy. The head guy, he was one of the head Mormon guys. Mormon churches do not have pastors. They pick somebody out of their congregation who's, who's the stake. The stake is what they would call the local church. The stake leader, and he was the stake leader. He's the one who teaches the studies out of the Book of Mormon and stuff. And he asked me that question. We're standing right in this building. He asked me the question, well, have you, have you read the Book of Mormon? I go, yeah, I've read the Book of Mormon. He's super shocked. He goes, he just got excited. He goes, what'd you think? Did you pray about it? I go, yeah, I, I did, actually. And God told me it was, it was full of lies. And he went, ah, you didn't know what to do with that, you know? And I said, God's, it's clearly a falsehood. God showed that to me right away. And I didn't even need to say God showed it to me, but clearly God's godly wisdom showed to me that right away. And he did, they don't know what to do with that because that's not the right answer. They're supposed to go, well, yeah, it so, sounded good to me, okay? So it has a lot of the common ideas of its era, like, like black people, if you're black, you've been cursed by God. That's why you're black. Sorry. Okay, um, we all knew that anyhow, but, you know, um, <laughs> you're, if you're black, you're cursed by God. Now, where did that come from? Well, that, that came from the common era. There was a common teaching, like down in the South, that, you know, people who were darker skin, that's because of, that's, that's of the curse, you know, um, all the way back from Adam and Eve, okay? And that repeats all that kind of stuff in the Book of Mormon. So, bottom line, the Book of Mormon is a load of fooey. If you're looking for a fanciful tale or just want to entertain yourself and say, what do nutty people believe? Go ahead and read that, okay? But that's not where it's, that's just, that's just where it started. That's not where it ends. So these guys went to a real descent into the madness. Starting with six members, they grew because of the sale of the, this book of Mormon and the missionaries that were sent out to spread the word. And they went all over Europe and stuff like that. Ironically, they didn't go down to where the dark people were because they were cursed and in fact, um, they were not even allowed to become members of the church, okay? Or they could be, let me put it that way, they couldn't attain the priesthood. And you got to, to get the priesthood is what the goal of every Mormon is to get. And uh, Joseph became their prophet, and he was the voice of God, um, you know, for this latter age, right? And he became, when you give somebody a lot of power like that, they become autocratic and ultimately enamored by their power, and they start using it more, and he used it for a sexual advantage. He got the idea, he got the idea that um, because he was this prophet, that God was going to use him to issue, issue in uh, a whole new sexual way of behaving in the church uh, that would imitate the Old Testament where you might have two or three or four or more wives and concubines and stuff like that. He also printed it, we'll talk more about it in a second, he also printed his own money he built his own bank, his own cities. He raised his own army, okay, which is part of what got him killed in his police force. And he literally seriously considered running for the president of the United States. All right? This guy had an ego the size of a barn. All right? And he had all these followers who thought he was the prophet. So <clears throat> the new scriptures that came where all the problems are, are the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrines and Covenants. That's what they're called. Those are the two books that you find the, the stuff that makes, takes Mormonism far, far away from Christianity. And, for example, in one of those books is the Book of Abraham. And it's, this, is a, this is an example of how it worked, how his stuff works. So, in 1833, there was this traveling show. Now, Egypt had just been opened up by Napoleon, right? Napoleon's armies were in Egypt, and so all kinds of Europeans were going into Egypt, and they were digging around, finding mummies. In fact, Mark Twain went to Egypt and took a train ride. They had small train rides around there. Egypt didn't have any wood, but they had lots of mummies. And so many mummies that they would be digging mummies, because they mummified everything, cats, dogs, everything. And, and Mark Twain records them taking mummies and throwing them into the steam, into the uh, furnace of the, of the steam uh, locomotive and using that as fuel, you know? And they just had a pile of mummies back there where the coal would go, and they you know, throwing them in. So there are mummies everywhere, but Westerners, particularly Americans, had never seen of a mummy before. And mummies were an object of fascination. In fact, there was this idea if you could get a mummy and grind it up, 
Okay, grind it up, and you have mummy dust. You take mummy dust and you put it in your tea and coffee, and it will, you stir a little bit of that in there, and it'll give you some sort of elixir that will help you live forever. Well, come on, this is the age of the medicine show, you know, the guys that come to town, hey, one bottle of this, you know, you, you know all, you mix, all you have to do is mix a little bit of laudlum or some other kind of drug with it, and yeah, man, you're feeling like you can live forever with the mummy dust stuff, you know? And so they had all this kinds of stuff going on. And this guy shows up in 1833, um, <clears throat> this load of mummies, and he also had papyra, which is, is, is the sheets uh, that they used to, the, the Egyptians used to write on, okay, that they had dug out of some tomb. And Joseph Smith heard about it. He went to look at the mummies, and he saw this papyra, and he went, bing! Nobody... Nobody knew how to read hieroglyphics at that time. It was, there were mysteries. You know what hieroglyphics are, it's the Egyptian writing, right? Nobody could, nobody could read it. What he didn't know, what he didn't know at the time is the Rosetta Stone had just been dug up in Egypt, which became the key to translating, they, that's the key to translating Egyptian hieroglyphics uh, into language we can understand, so we can read hieroglyphics now. At the time, nobody, nobody knew about the Rosetta Stone. It, just, it was just being discovered, and certainly Joseph Smith didn't know about it in the middle of the Midwest. So he looked at these, and he goes, oh, I have from God the gift of translation. Give me those, give me those, those papyri. And he said, you know what? Abraham, Father Abraham, wrote this with his own hand. These are his writings. And I'm going to translate them for you. And in, in the um, Pearl of Great Price and Doctrines and Covenants, we have, ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, the actual writings of Father Abraham. Now, when you see them translated, it's, it's crazy stuff. The doctrines and ideas in there are crazy stuff. But he could get away with it because <clears throat> nobody could say, well, you can't, you, you can't read that. By the way, um, that papyrus, they thought it was lost. Uh, the, the Mormons moved you know, from, from the Midwest. They moved to Salt Lake City. And somewhere in the process, they thought they had lost all those valuable papyrus. They were historical things. Turns out they weren't lost. They're in the 1960s, that we, they were rediscovered. They were not just, not just rediscovered, but they were rediscovered with Joseph Smith's notes attached to them, the translation, right? And he had drawn, he had drawn the fac a facsimile of the front cover, which, which appeared, um, which still appears in the book of, of Abraham uh, in the Doctrines and Covenants, one of their holy books. But we can read it now. We can read everything now. We know exactly what it says. You know what it is? That was the words of Abraham, and this whole book of many pages, it's a funeral text for Egyptians, talking about how you embalm guys and you know, what, what kind of mints and stuff to bring and throw it on. It's, it's a common funeral text that anybody can read. So what does that tell you about Joseph Smith? He's a, liar. He's a total liar, just a con man. But everybody believed that, OK? That's, that's what's in their holy books, stuff like that, all right? Um, Doctrines and Covenants contains a bunch of lectures um, from Joseph Smith, and it's an open book. What that means is that it can be added to, because they believe, they believe that the, when the church elects, when, the, when their current prophet dies, they elect a new prophet, and God speaks directly to him, and he can make up new stuff and add it to the Doctrines and Covenants books, right? So that's like, like, I, like say, if I was the prophet for Christianity, God could speak to me and I go, hey, we're going to add the book of Rick to the Bible, right? And Mormons would go along with that because that's what they believe. It's an open book. But they can also subtract stuff for it, too. So, for example, in the 1800s, um, they had, initially they had a, a law that restricted marriage between a man and a woman. One man, one woman. Mormons are famous for what? Polygamy, Polygamy yeah, for having one man and a whole bunch of women. And they, the prophet got a new, a new revelation that, that, that you could get multiple marriages. And they, so he got that revelation. And everybody in, uh, in the Mormon world, started, all the guys started getting multiple wives. It turned into a big deal. And that ran until, uh, ran until Utah wanted to become a state. 
And the U.S. government goes, uh, no, you're not going to become a state. We don't recognize polygamy. And suddenly, guess what happened? The prophet got another revelation. You know, it's 60, 70 years down the line that said, the Lord has said it's now time to stop polygamy. So they could come and go. Same thing would happen with blacks in the priesthood. Um, blacks were not allowed to be in the priesthood until Martin Luther King came along. Martin Luther King, as you know, civil rights guy, civil rights became the big thing in, in the news. And suddenly the prophet got a revelation that now blacks could become um, uh, the top, top guys in the church, or actually the priesthood. The priesthood's how you get to heaven. We'll, we'll touch that, okay? And like I said, Joseph Smith talked the dark skin was a curse from God. They said it's no longer a curse. God's changed his mind. So it's a very convenient. It moves with culture, right? Um, Joseph Smith believed he was the only one that could translate the Bible. They believe in the Bible as long as it's translated correctly, but he's the only one that could correctly translate it. That's why he was, before he got killed, um, he was busy translating the Bible correctly by doing crazy stuff. Most of it he just left as it was, changed a little word here and there, except he started adding verses, like in Genesis he added, and there will be a man whose name will be Joseph, and he will come and, and have great revelations and tell me many, many wonderful things. It's not in any of the original manuscripts anywhere in the Old Testament. Any, it's not in the Dead Sea Scrolls or anything. But Joseph Smith said, somebody forgot to put this in. They dropped the piece of paper as they were writing the book of, book of Genesis. So God's told me that should be inserted. So it's got nonsense like that in it. They, by the way, the Mormons do not. They have Joseph Smith's Bible, but they don't release it. It's, you can get it, but it's hard to get. But it's, it's there. Okay? The polygamy game. Polygamy game, in the end, is what got Joseph, killed, Joseph Smith killed. So it's kind of important to do. But you, you can sense where this guy was at. This is before they got chased out of town. But he had at least 36 different, let's just, he called them wives. They really weren't wives, though. They were all hookups. Okay? He, in fact, his, his own wife, Emma, was, went out of her mind when, he, when she found out that he was screwing around with a 14-year-old girl. Okay? That was the first girl that we know of that he was messing around with. Sorry, Emma. No relation, okay? Um, she, was, she heard about that, and, and so Joseph Smith said, well, he tried to tell her that it was a prophecy. God said he should do it, and she was not having any part of it. Most wives wouldn't. And so he kept this really secret, and, um, and even though rumors are floating around, he was really smart how he did it. Now, remember, this guy, every season is the prophet. He's the top schmuck, and God's speaking directly through him. God's given him all these great powers to translate in this new Bible to come through. So he's, he's Peter, Paul, you know, John, everybody all rolled into one. And so people really revere him. And what he would do, he would go, oh, look, you know, um, say you two guys were married, right? Just pretend. He'd go, I need you to go on a mission for me. And he'd send you to Sweden or someplace really far away, you know? While he's gone, I come over to your house and I go, um, you know, can I pray with you today about your husband? And you go, yeah, that's really nice of you. And he goes, you know, God's put it on my heart. I, I want to tell you about a revelation. And, and he's told me to tell you about it. But I can't tell anybody else about it. It's just you. And, and if you tell anybody, you will die, you know. And you're going, oh, wow, it's, it must be a heavy thing. And I would say, and I'd start laying out how God wants us to, to have multiple wives in heaven, and, and we, we seal a marriage, and yeah, you know, you would be married, still married to him on earth, but in heaven, if we seal our marriage here, you and I will be married, and of course, because I'm the prophet, you know, you're going to be, and you know, you'll have that bigger room and nicer view and stuff like that, and, and so I would convince, if I was Joe Smith, I'd be trying to talk you into this, of, and, and well, how do you seal a marriage? well, why don't we just come into the bedroom and I'll show you how, oh, you know? That's exactly what he was doing. Huh? Well, what's, we're going to find out how, how Joseph Smith, why Joseph Smith died in a little while, but, but he pulled this scam on at least, at, we know of factually, at least 36 other gals in the church, probably a lot more, okay? And they're all sworn to secrecy because what happens to you if you tell? 
You, die. you don't want to die, do you? Okay, right? And now, not only that, but you, you know, quietly, you and I wink at each other and stuff like that because we got this secret. You're going to be one of my wives in heaven. Woohoo, you know? And, you know, and if he's gone for a long time, maybe, maybe we'll have to get sealed a little bit more. You know, that, that kind of stuff. And he would do that. His wife didn't know about it. Now, today, a guy like that, because the first gal was 14 years old, he would have been in jail, right? He would have been, the Me Too movement would have had him for lunch. But he could get away with it. And he did get away with it. Um, what he ended up doing, he ended up sending somebody, to, somebody all the way for a mission trip, okay? And then he went after his wife. Same kind of scam. But that time, the wife went, no way, Jose. You know, I heard some rumors about this. You know, you try this. You're, you try that on me. You're a false prophet. That's what she said to him. You're a false prophet. I'm going to tell my husband. Well, it so happened her husband was one of the wealthiest guys in the Mormon church. He, he was so wealthy that he had a lot of influence. And, um, and when he came back from the mission trip, Joseph Smith said, if, if you say anything, you'll die. Da, da, da. He gave her the whole spiel. But right, the first thing when her husband got off the coach, she walked up to him and goes, you want to know what happened while you were gone? Right? And yeah, good for her. And so that guy, he got totally pissed off. He goes to Joseph Smith. He puts his finger in him and he goes, you, you're a false prophet. I heard what you did to my wife. And Joseph Smith said, your wife's nuts. While you're gone, she's been, you know, she's been eating weird fruits and stuff. She's nuts, you know. And, and she's making all that up. She's got something against me because, you know, he, meant, he went down the thing and he's going, no, 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 no. She's telling me the truth. I've been hearing a little bit of this rumors too. And he was letting guys in selectively on it, you know. And some of them, some of them go, well, do I get to have another wife? And he goes, well, brother, we'll see. And, and, you know, just slowly trying to bring that into the church. And this guy went off on him. And so Joseph Smith, because he was a top guy, because he had a militia, because he had a police force, because he printed money, because he owned banks. And by the way, you say, how did he print money? Because in those territories, they weren't even in Utah, though, by then. But they, they were in territories where you could print your own money. Banks could, in those days, could print your own money. You had U.S. currency, but you also had a bank that had currency. Well, this money was virtually no good. It was ripping people off. And he was ripping people off on all kinds of levels. And all the rumors about polygamy and stuff were starting to leak out. You know how secrets kind of leak out like that? They were starting to leak out into the, what they called the Gentile community, which would be you guys. And, and so people were hearing about this, and this guy says, I, I'm going to expose you. So he bought a printing press. Because he could. He couldn't be forced out of town because he had too much money. He actually literally owned stuff. He set up a printing press and he printed one issue of a newspaper. One. And you know what the story was on the front headlines? Oh, come on. You know what the story was. What? Yeah, exactly. Joseph Smith, rapist, you know, that whole type of thing, right? Just fully exposed him. The next day after it came out, Joseph Smith sent his militia over. They broke into the building where the printing press uh, was, and they destroyed it. They, they destroyed it. They, they collected every piece of newspaper that they could get and burned all those. And he thought he was rid of this guy, but he didn't know that a bunch of those newspapers had already gone out to the other communities and got spread around. And in America, even it was America still, you can't just go and you can't just go and destroy somebody's property and not go to jail, right? So Joseph Smith was arrested for that. But it was because he was diddling around with other people's wives that the death of Joseph Smith occurred. So he was enraged by this newspaper account that exposed his sexual activity. And his own courts dismissed the warrants. Because remember, he controlled everything. He had his own courts. And they said, oh, this is silly. We need to do it. Um, and he had 5,000 Guys, a 5,000-man army, that's a pretty good-sized army to protect him. But to avoid having to send U.S. troops in to fight him, he made a deal with the Illinois governor, because that's where this is at, to guarantee his safety for trial. And so they decided to put him in a, in a house, a brick house. It was a two-story brick house. And they let him go in with his brother and a friend. And there's just a couple guys there uh, with him to sort of be the quote-unquote guards. But he went in with guns. They, Joseph Smith and his brother had guns. So they weren't like prisoners in handcuffs. They were armed guys going into a house. 
Well, frontier justice, if you've seen Westerns, you kind of know what that looks like. Frontier justice found out about where he was at. And a couple hundred men surrounded this house, and they had a gunfight. Okay? In the ensuing gunfight, some of the, some of the mob was killed but his brother was shot to death, and Joseph Smith crawled up in the upper window, like in that picture, and he was actually, Joseph Smith had been a Mason. Any of you know what a Mason is? Mason was a secret order. It's, it's really weird, you know. It was a secret order, kind of a cult, but it was real big in the, in the 1800s and even early 1900s. You know, some of your grandfathers might have been Masons, but they had these secret handshakes and stuff like that. He had been a Mason, um, but he, he quit that when he started his own religion, and he was actually giving the Masonic signal for, for help when he was on the upper story, hoping that some people in the crowd would be, would be Masons, because the Masons are supposed to protect each other, and some guy who wasn't a Mason obviously shot him, and he fell out of the window, he was wounded, and the other guy walked up with a musket and just pulled the trigger and just blew his brains out right there um, on the ground. That was the end of Joseph Smith, but that was not the end of the Mormons. Because what, unfortunately, that did, they should have let him go to trial, but what that did is made him a martyr. Yeah. Worst thing you can do to a guy like that is make him a martyr. <laughs> but now they had to beat it out of Dodge, right? Or out of Illinois. And so they started this trek westward to Utah. We had, you, they'd, they'd found this area in Utah that nobody really was inhabiting except some Indians. And so they decided to move everybody lock, stock, and barrel. And it's actually... You know, it's quite a rigorous thing that they did. It was amazing. A lot of it was done by hand carts. This is a hand cart. See, I'm pulling it. They walked from Illinois to Salt Lake City, many of them during the winter time. Hundreds of them froze to death along the way. And they had all their possessions in these hand carts. Okay? And a lot of them were guys fresh, fresh off the boat. They, were, they, were been, they had been recruited by missionaries in Europe. And they get to America, they get on a train, the train takes them to, from, from New York City to Illinois, and they get off the train, because the train, doesn't get, train tracks don't go any further in those days than Illinois. And then they say, where are the Mormons? Oh, well, here's your hand cart, go catch up with them. So these people don't even speak English, you know, and they're out in the middle of the Wild West with a hand cart trying to survive all that way. They end up in Utah, and all kinds of factions split from the church at that time. Uh, Emma, his wife, not, not being really thrilled with the whole polygamy thing and stuff like that, she said, son, my son Joseph Smith Jr. is the one who should be the head of the church. It was a big fight to be who was going to be the head of the church. She said, my son should be it. And polygamy thing, we don't do that. And so they, st they stuck around Illinois. Some other guys started. There's probably about four or five factions right away that split off. But the main faction um, ended up with Brigham Young as the leader, and they left and went to Utah. And, um, and they had tensions with the U.S. government uh, over polygamy and, and how he ruled, because this guy was a pretty cruel guy. He had, I think, 26 wives, Brigham Young. I don't know how he pulls that off. I have one wife, and that's oh, 55, I'm sorry. 50, yeah, then that's, that's right. Okay, different side, okay. Yeah, he had a lot of wives, right? And so this guy, you know, this guy was into it. And by the way, do the math on that. If, if the average guy's got between 55, they say 26 and 55 wives, what is that going to mean in your population base? It's going to be like all women. <laughs> well, yeah, there's, huh? Majority of women. Majority of women of what, or what? It's gonna, what it's going to mean is, yeah, it's good, you're going to have not too many guys are going to be married. You have a lot of single guys, right? So there's going to be this whole crew of single guys, and they started running into that real quick out there, and so they would send out missionaries to go get more. But they did some really gnarly things under, under Brigham Young. There was a wagon train. <clears throat> there was a wagon train in 1857 um, that was coming through Mormon territory, and there's friction going on with the U.S. government. And these guys... They, I believe they were coming out of Louisiana or someplace like that, um, on their way to California. And it was men, women, and children. And Brigham Young saw them as a threat for some reason, crossing over Mormon territory to get to the Oregon Trail and, or get into California on the way of the Oregon Trail. They don't actually go into Oregon, but a little below that. And so he got in cahoots with local Indians, and they ended up slaughtering um, 
you know, the Mormons pretended, the Indians attacked, the Mormons said, came riding in, because, hey, 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 we'll, we'll give you a safe passage. These Indian guys, we know how to control them. So they said, okay, so they said, but you gotta put down your guns. I said, okay, they put their guns down. And as they're walking along, one of the Mormon guys gives the nod, and all the Mormon guys with guns raised theirs. The Indians turned, came swinging in from behind and literally slaughtered every man, woman, and child um, who was above the age, I believe, of 10. Okay? And they took all the children and they put them in Mormon homes and raised them as Mormons. They buried them all there. Their, their bones are still there um, in Utah in the Mountain Meadows area. And to this day, they deny Young's involvement in it. But um, eventually, there was pressure by the US government to, make, to blame somebody. So they blamed one of the top Mormon uh, military guys who, who basically said, hey, Young, Young put me up to it. But they go, oh, I'm just trying to save your neck. And so they executed him. But um, he was the only Mormon prosecuted for the crime. So this shows you how radical and crazy and brutal it was. Okay? So members of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints unequivocally affirm themselves to be Christians. Do they sound like Christians to you? No, they're not. Okay? Um, here's what makes it a cult. The, the unbiblical doctrine. Comparison to Christianity. God is a spirit, personal, eternal, infinite creator. Only God necessary for all other things exist. Eternally as the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mormonism, God's a heavenly father who is an exalted man with a physical body of flesh and bone who has his wives and have billions of spirit children. By the way, do you ever notice that Mormons baptize for the dead? Ever heard of that? So Mormons, ever heard of Ancestry.com, the company Ancestry, if you want to find out your ancestors? That's a Mormon country, a company. They, they are really big in genealogies. The reason they're really big in genealogies is because you could be baptized for the dead. So if somebody was a kind of a, somebody never heard about Mormonism, was sort of a good person, and they're in your ancestral train or even just a stranger, you can go and be baptized for them, and that boots them up into heaven, a higher position of heaven. They, they even got baptized for Adolf Hitler, believe it or not. Um, so they practice that because of their view. Um, and Trinity is denied. There's separate entities. And the cool thing about it is we will also become gods with our own solar system, our own wives. So we get to be like the god that created this solar system. Lucky you. If you're a Mormon, you get your own solar system to get to be the god of that. A little bit different than Christian belief. Jesus, well, you guys know the, 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 the difference between that is Mormons believe he was a spiritual firstborn son of God in the pre-existence. They do not hold a Christian view of who Jesus was. Heaven and hell, there's no hell, but there's three levels of heaven. First level is for Mormons only, okay? They get all the good stuff. Second, for good people. Third, for not so good people. And hell, if there is a hell, is for the apostates from the Mormon faith and for the devil, so if you're a Mormon and you run off from Mormonism, then you go to what would be called hell. But for the rest of us, just regular guys, uh, we get level one, two, or three. And it's all based on works, how hard you work for your salvation, which is why they go door to door, which is why when you're 18, most of you who are Mormons, you'd be sent out on a mission, right? And you spend, you spend the next nine months in some foreign country trying to convince people that all this nonsense is true. Um, and like I said, they were baptized for the dead in order to help unredeemed souls achieve salvation in the afterlife and move up the ladder to a better form of heaven. The bedrock of authority, bottom line, is Joseph Smith and his writings and the new prophets that come along and give oracles as, as, they, as they end up. Christianity, of course, the Bible is the final authority. It's unchangeable and fixed. All right? Tons of intellectual problems in this. It's really tough to be a think good thinker and a Mormon. Way too many problems, which, by the way, is eating away at the Mormon church. They now have two divisions of Mormonism, not official divisions, but two technical divisions. One is called Fundamentalist Mormons. They just, the, you know, I only read the Book of Mormon. That, I only read the doctrine, Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants. That's it. I'm not open to anything else. And the other are called Internet Mormons. Because this information I'm telling you hasn't been available. You go to a Deseret bookstore, which is the Mormon bookstore. It's the only place you're allowed to buy books about Mormonism doesn't have any information that I've been telling you. That's all been hidden. 
Now they go on the internet and they find all this stuff about Joseph Smith. They could track all of his, all the gals he was sleeping with, the whole shenanigan stuff, and they're going, whoa, 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 whoa. Even the Book of Mormon, they realize the genetic, the, the DNA doesn't work. Um, you know, the accounts of all the different animals doesn't work. And so there's this movement in Mormonism that's saying, well, the Book of Mormon isn't supposed to be historical. It's an allegory. And they're sort of moving the cheese a little bit. But what's really happening is people are abandoning the church because it's just too much nonsense to be able to swallow. So it's tough to be, and especially when your criteria is emotional, not intellectual, you believe because it feels good in your heart. Since when is that the measurement of truth? How you feel, you know? It's pretty current right now. It's pretty current right now, but it's still not the measurement of truth. It's an absolutely idiotic way, you know, you know to, to measure what's really true is how, if you feel that it's true. So it's tougher to be a Mormon as that, and there's a bunch of wacky stuff that goes along with it. You know what you're looking at? Underwear. Underwear. Yeah. You lucky people, if you are Mormons, you get to wear underwear, okay? And, and Mormons, when they get married, they're issued special underwear that a good Mormon will always wear. Now, it's not, this is a little older stuff. Now they have, they have little nice little tank tops for girls, and you know, a little more bikini style for girls and stuff like that. But the guy's thing is pretty much looks the same. And what makes it special, it's got this little embroidery. It's, it's almost a Masonic symbol on it that it's, it's holy underwear. And so you only get to wear this. You only get to wear this when you're, when you're, yeah, it's holy. It's holy. Hey, man, it's, you know, just a few where they got the little things. But uh, it's, it's considered sacred underwear. And you get it when you, only people that are married can get it. It makes me want to join right now, I'll tell you. I need a pair of those briefs, like, in, you know. Um, if you know adult Mormons who are married, look for the underwear peeking out from their shirts. Or, yeah, they wear it. In fact, a really good Mormon, when they're taking their shower, will put a finger on it while they're taking their shower. Because this, this is a sacred garment that's been issued to you by the church to represent everything holy. They wash it? Yeah, they wash it. They have several pairs. But you can't buy that just anywhere that's not for sale at Walmart. You have to go to the Deseret Bookstore and buy it there. You go, sometime if you're in Mormon country, find the Deseret, if you come from a big city, find the Deseret Bookstore and just walk in and go, um, listen, I'm looking for some underwear. Where, where would you have that? Oh, it's right back here in this thing. And, but they will require, they'll ask you, what stake are you from? In other words, they want to know, they want to know that you're actually a Mormon. Or are you married? You know, they just don't sell it to anybody. You got to sort of show your Mormon card. They also have these cool secret handshakes. You've heard of secret handshakes, right? They literally have secret handshakes that they, that they show. So um, this is a sign of, the, you touch the nails. It's a sign of the Chalcedic priesthood. Um, they have all these different grips that they do. And these are things that you're taught how to shake hands when you're a priest. In the, that's part of the cool stuff. You get all the cool secret, literally the secret handshakes. This is straight, this is straight, this, <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, this, stuff's, this stuff's straight out of all the, uh, you know, the stuff that they used to practice in the 1800s and, and the different kinds of clubs that they had and stuff like that. Um, if you want to get married, this is what you get to wear. See the gal in her wedding gown there? Well, you can't see her hairdo. It's not very nice. But this, this is her waiting to get married. You cannot, if you're not a Mormon, you cannot attend a Mormon wedding. They get married in the temple. Okay? They get sealed in the temple. They call it a sealing in the temple. They, and they have, not, not the local church. No, there's their husband's there with them. Yeah, Yeah. What? <laughs> okay. It is funny. It's ridiculous. Um, the temple, there's only one temple in Hawaii. Temples are not everywhere. So if you're a Mormon in Hawaii, to get to, you'll fly over to Oahu, to the temple in Oahu, to, get, to actually literally get sealed in the temple. Okay? You get to wear this cool little green, green deal on you like this. Um, it's a little... They kind of look like chefs, but they look like Indian chefs or something. Yeah. How expensive are these? I'm not. I don't. I don't know how much mine cost. Um, 
Yeah, look on Amazon, maybe. <laughs> And, and this is part of, the, this is part of this, this, the temple ceremony and stuff like that. Wait, this is the guy that wears the wedding? No, this is, this is your priesthood stuff. When you get to be a priesthood, that's your priesthood dress, right? So, I mean, let, let me just put it this way. Nobody's allowed to talk about it. No, these, are, these are serendipitous photos. They were taken secretly, okay? Nobody's supposed to expose it, talk about it. You can go online and type in more Mormon underwear and see. And by the way, this, until not too long ago, this was all long johns. I mean, well into the 60s, the only Mormon underwear was long johns. So you're really out of luck if you wore shorts, you know. Um, it's, it's wacky doodle, right? But this is all comes, if you, Doctrines and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, all those crazy books, they all prescribe this kind of stuff. And... If you're looking for more information, you can hit this one um, and this book by Fran Brody. Okay, I, I hear that voice. Um, so, anyway, there's some great stuff about Mormons. Um, we may go into some of this later, but if you're interested, it's a wild ride. It is a wild ride, and it's amazing to me that any thinking person could ever be a Mormon. And I think maybe right now, none of you really want to sign up. So any questions? Huh? You want to sign up for that? Yeah. How did you learn so much about this? Mormons have been a hobby of mine for decades. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time talking to Mormons and to people that, that were ex-Mormons and spilled all the beans on it. Wait, Yeah. Has a Mormon ever knocked at your door? Yeah, yeah. like, did you have a conversation with Oh, I have conversations with Mormons every chance I get. No, it's really hard to convert. You know what? First of all, they're not, gonna, they're not just going to go, you're right, I'm wrong. Yeah. Because, because they're, they're suspect, they suspect everything you're telling them is a lie. So what you have to do is you have to say, look, you check out the evidence. You check it out. And Wait, you present. So everyone's lying unless they're Mormon. Yes. Uh, the world is against them. Well, I mean, think about it now. The secular, secular <laughs> culture, the lies secular culture has about Christianity. Yeah. Yeah, Katie. Yes? The Mason, the Mason is not technically, they don't really, I wouldn't call him a cult, I call him a weirdo outfit. Yeah, they're, they're a secret club. You know what they really were? Masons and the Elks Club and stuff like that. They were, what they really were, they were a charade kind of a private, and it was, it was generally was men only, and then they started a women's division. But it was generally a way, because liquor was, liquor was uh, impossible to get at a certain places and certain times, so they would go to these meetings, and they'd have a private bar there. And so these guys would go to these meetings and have their secret handshakes and do their funny things, and then they'd all get plastered. Um, that was sort of why those secret things were. Yeah. Could you go back like five slides so I can write something down? Sure. <laughs> Oops, going ahead. Which one did you want? Yeah, that one. Okay. All right, any other question about Mormonism? So, you know, the next time somebody says, well, Christianity is weird, just point them to Mormonism. You know, that's, that takes the cake. Now, by the way, by the way, my guess is that Mormonism will is collapsing like a, like a house of cards right now. Yeah. Um, be sympathetic to your Mormon friends. It's real easy to laugh at them. I mean, we're laughing at them right now, and they sort of deserve it, you know? But a, but a, lot, of, a lot of your Mormon friends, they, they don't know even a lot of the stuff I'm telling you. I mean, they've seen the garments and stuff like that, but they don't know a lot of the facts of plagiarism. They, they think that the, the things about Joseph Smith diddling around with a bunch of women are, are made up by enemies of the church. They're, that's what they're told. Even though it's all, you can document it all. Um, there, there are people who are really, I mean, they, they trust their leaders. They trust their parents and their grandparents. It's a very family. There's positive things about them. They're a very family-oriented bunch of people. And just like you trust your parents and you trust the, the church that you were raised in, that's how they are. The thing is that they were handed a can of worms. Yeah. They're not supposed to. No? Well, they they will ask. They will ask, but at a certain point, they're just they just you just have to believe, sister. 
You just have to believe. Well, okay, so, all right. Most of you, before you came here and heard somebody challenge um, uh, a short earth worldview, right? You know, you just, somebody told you that the earth was 10,000 years old, and you go, okay, right? You didn't really challenge it. You just go, okay. You come here, and we challenge that a little bit. Say there's, there's, two, there's another point of view that's, that's viable. Um, you can take either point of view you want, but there is another point of view. And so uh, they're not allowed to challenge anything. Yeah. It's, it's the party line or nothing. Yeah. Well, they, they're learning English and math and all kinds of stuff. Brigham Young is just a regular university. They have a religion class. But they, I, I got to tell you, if you ever go to a Mormon religion class, it's like it, it's just the most boring thing in the world, you know. No, it's, not, it's, a, little bit of, it's a little bit of history or, you know, t- talking about some Mormon thing. That, but remember, these people have been raised in Mormonism their whole life. So this is natural to them. This is normal to them. They don't think it's weird. They think it's just normal. Yeah. And, and they, we didn't even get into the stuff like some of you, there's some stuff on, on uh, Netflix right now and stuff about blood atonement. I've seen it. Have you seen that film? It's gnarly, you know, because they believe, they believe you're a Mormon and you go off the rails real bad and you become an enemy to the church. Then the only way you can possibly be saved is by your own blood being shed. And, and this is not right now Mormons disavow that. But for many years, especially under Brigham Young and stuff, that was a, that was a big deal. And so Mormons who, who bailed, would be, they'd be slaughtered. They'd find them with their throats cut by their own people. Blood atonement. Yeah. We believe there's a blood atonement too, but it comes from somebody on a cross, not from getting your neck sliced. So. Yeah. Yeah, they'd kill them. The story, the, story is about a, the story that's on Netflix is just recently there was a... Um, a, a guy who's, who's, uh, who killed some people for blood atonement. That's what they did. No. Well, yes and no. Um, that's a really good question. So the guy, remember I told you the Mormon guy who was here? Yeah. He was from Mexico. And he, he spoke English really well. And I didn't know he was Mormon, but this whole crew was here. And they were all from Mexico. And they are all white. And they all spoke English really well, and I started thinking about it. All right. So I went up to them, and I go, before I met their, their leader, I went up to those guys and go, hey, by any chance, were you, were you in a, raised in a Mormon community in Yucatan? And they go, yeah. How'd you know? Because they didn't sound like Mormons. They were kind of what we call Jack Mormons. Jack Mormons are Mormons who aren't really following Mormonism. Kind of, it's kind of a distant frequency in their life. And, well, the reason I know is because when... When they outlawed polygamy, the church split. A small fraction of them said, this, this was a uh, revelation from God. How dare we change this revelation from God? And they went down to Mexico and set up a Mormon colony down there that practiced polygamy and still pla- practices polygamy in Mexico. And these guys are kids from that polygamous cult that live here on Kauai that aren't practicing polygamy, but that's where they came from. So yeah, some of them do. And there, by the way, the Mormon church itself, the official Mormon church, looks down on those guys. Those guys are, they're, uh, they're guys who have uh, screwed up because they're not listening to, to the prophet. The prophet has declared that God wants polygamy to stop, so you need to stop. So God changes his mind a lot in the Mormon church. Yeah. yeah. As a convenient, right? Thank you, guys. Thanks. All right. Thanks.